Hey, today we're going to continue on in a series that we're a few weeks into entitled Family Matters. Can you say Family Matters? Family Matters. Come on, turn up the volume. Say Family Matters. Family Matters. Family Matters. We, we've spent the last number of weeks understanding, first and foremost, that because of Jesus, all of us can experience this thing called belonging. So no matter if you have a good relationship with your family, a bad relationship, maybe no relationship, when you are in Christ, you are welcomed into this place of belonging. Last week, Pastor Doug preached an incredible message on marriage, and we preached that across our campuses, and I was up at our North Tacoma campus installing Pastor Josiah as our new North Tacoma campus pastor. We're so excited for him and all that God is going to do up and through our campus in North Tacoma. But we talked about the meaning of marriage. And now today, we're going to continue on in this journey. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this message title down because I want to spend the next few moments talking about raise them up. Raise them up. In a moment, we're going to go to Judges chapter 2. But today, I think it's important for us to be reminded something will outlast us. Something will outlast us. See, much like a boat traveling through water that leaves a wake behind it, our lives, as we travel day by day, there is a wake that our lives leave. And trust me, something will outlast us. I hope that we will pass on the reality that life is a gift. I hope that will outlast us. I hope that we will pass on more than just memories of us sitting together, staring at our devices. Come on, how many of you have been with family gatherings recently where everybody's together, but nobody's together? By the way, this isn't just a young generation thing, because I've seen a lot of gray-haired people. Yes, I know I have gray hair, so I'm including myself, okay? Okay. But I hope we pass on more than just memories of, man, you know what was amazing? That one Christmas where we all sat around, we didn't talk, we didn't connect meaningfully, but we liked stuff on social media. It's amazing. I hope that we will pass on a love for scripture, a love for growing in biblical community, a love for others, a love for the gospel, a love for putting the fruit of the spirit on display. I hope that in America, we will pass on something more substantial than our national debt. I hope that we will pass on even something as simple as a love for good music. Come on, somebody. And that the generations to come will avoid listening to country music. Come on. You know it's true. You know it's true. I love you. It's okay. It's okay. Something will outlast us, and that is on us. Something will outlast us, and we got, we got to understand that is on us. That's our responsibility. And to put context to this, let's go to the book of Judges, chapter 2. By this point in Israel's journey, God had delivered his people from slavery in the land of Egypt. He raised up a man named Moses who led the people out of Egypt, out of slavery. And what should have been just a few days journey ended up turning into 40 years of wandering in the wilderness because the people chose to not believe God. And God said, listen, all of you who have rebelled, this whole generation's gonna die in the wilderness. But there was another generation that was growing up in the midst of that wilderness journey. And that generation, what did they see? They saw the miracles of God. They saw water flow from the rock. They themselves tasted and ate manna that God himself provided. They knew about this God named Yahweh and that he not only made a covenant, that he was faithful to keep his covenant. And Moses, even the leader, he, he messed up and he died looking at the promised land, but he was not allowed to go into the promised land. That assignment was given to a younger leader named Joshua. And Joshua and that whole generation experienced another miracle. They crossed through the Jordan River on dry ground. God made the water stop flowing. 
And the very next thing they see is God destroy the city of Jericho. The walls fell down around that city. So this whole generation, like you don't have to try to convince them because they've seen it for themselves. They know that God is good. Oh, yes, he is. And they begin to possess the land that God had promised. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves in Judges chapter two. We find out that Joshua has died. Not only that, look with me, Judges chapter two, verse 10. It says this, the whole generation, that whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. After, can you say after? After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. You would ask me, Tyler, what are some of the saddest words in scripture? It's right here. The difference between one generation to the next. After them, though they had tasted the manna themselves, they saw with their own eyes, God performed miracles. After them, there rose up a generation who did not know the Lord or the things that he had done for Israel. And here's the consequence of that. The Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They worshiped the Baals, the false gods, and abandoned the Lord the God of their ancestors who brought them out of Egypt. They followed other gods from the surrounding peoples and bowed down to them. They angered the Lord for they abandoned him and worshiped Baal in the Asherahs. Consider how quickly a change took place. From one generation to the next, commitment was replaced by complacency. And that complacency was replaced by compromise. And that compromise led them, it paved the way for spiritual corruption. And the question is this, what generation is at fault? Now, depending on where you land on the age spectrum is probably gonna influence how you answer that question. Because those of us who are younger in years, I'll, I'll group myself in with that group for a moment. Why? Because I'm on the stage. I get to do that. So for those of us who are younger, it's very easy to go, well, the older generation didn't do their part in passing down what should have been passed in. But as we age, and with my gray hair, I'll include myself in this part. The older generation, we can quickly look at the younger generation and go, well, if their hearts wouldn't, wouldn't be so hard. I mean, we tried to tell them. We tried to show them the way, but, but they wouldn't listen. I mean, if they had a few less holes in their face from their piercings, then maybe, just maybe. And isn't it interesting that the very thing that God wanted to use to bless the generations quickly becomes divided. The question is, what, what generation is at fault? And here's the reality. It was probably on both of the generations. Because it appears like the older generation that had seen those things didn't do a good job of transferring or leading or modeling the way for them. And the younger generation didn't seem open or willing or accepting to open their hearts to the goodness of this God who had provided Tyler, what's the point? Well, the point is this. No one is exempt from the assignment to help raise up this generation to love and to serve Jesus. Let me say that again a little bit more slowly. No one is exempt. No one is exempt. From what? From this assignment to help raise up this generation to love and to serve Jesus. We cannot delegate leading and developing this generation to love and serve Jesus. And that's always a danger. Because for some of us today, we go, well, Tyler, what are you talking about? That's not my job. That's why we have a kids ministry here. Tyler, that's not my job. That's why we have a youth pastor. That's Pastor Nate. That's on him. No, hear me. None of us are exempt from the assignment. See, what does this generation need? This generation needs both parenting and mentoring. 
And so today, you might not be a parent, you might not be a grandparent, and it would be very easy for you to go, you know what, Tyler, you're talking to the wrong crowd. No, I'm not. Because even though you might not have kids or grandkids, you are called to help mentor this generation. Mentor them, help shape them. Well, Tyler, that, that's, not, that's not my job. That's not my responsibility. That's why I give in the offering because that's the youth pastor's job. And what we have to remember is at best, most of the kids that we have at LC Kids, most of the kids that we have at LC Students, we get them for maybe three to four hours a month. And how many hours are they in your home? How many hours are they on their campus? How many hours are they living in our communities? You see, the ministries here, they exist to come alongside of us in this process, in this journey. Instead of delegating their development to their phones or their devices, which by the way, are forming their lives, we have a responsibility to lean in. And none of us are exempt from that assignment. You see, if you are a disciple of Jesus, you have an assignment to make disciples. You have an assignment. It's not just for pastors. It's not just for the quote unquote professionals. If you are a disciple, so let me ask you, who are you discipling? Who, who are you discipling? Who are you walking alongside of? Well, Tyler, I don't know enough of the Bible. Okay, listen, we, we can help you in that journey, but there will never be a moment where you finally go, oh, I finally have it all figured out. Now I can disciple somebody. By the way, did you notice who Jesus entrusted his work to? Flawed people who by God's grace were still like working to figure it out and the, the Holy Spirit was equipping them and working in them. And guess what? The Holy Spirit is still active working in us and equipping yes, us. Right. You see, if you are a disciple of Jesus, you are called to make disciples. A disciple isn't just something we become. A disciple is also something that we are called to make. And today, it's important for us to recognize this generation is taking its cues on what it is to follow Jesus as they look at our lives. Can I say something a little bit stronger? I wasn't looking for permission, but I'm gonna say it anyways. <laughs> this generation is taking its cues on what it is to follow Jesus as they look at your social media feed. See, my question is, what, what is this generation left to believe as it relates to following Jesus? That maybe following Jesus is, is a nominal commitment to occasional Sunday morning activity? That we, we occasionally go to church, and, and that's what it is to follow Jesus. We occasionally do this. More on that a little bit later in the message. Are they left to believe that following Jesus is a call to be consistently enraged? Anybody else you've noticed a lot of Christians are always ticked off now? By the way, you wanna be less ticked and enjoy life more? Turn your phone off. I love you. Are they left to believe that following Jesus is for those who love hypocrisy? Because it seems like that's what the storyline is. See, a few things for, for us to understand about what this means for us is we have this responsibility to raise them up. And what is that? Number one is this. Each generation needs to decide. Come on, can you say the word decide? Decide. decide. Each generation. And so yes, that deals with the younger generation, but today, for those of us in the room who maybe aren't yet following Jesus, you gotta make a decision. Joshua said it this way in Joshua chapter 24. He's talking to the people of Israel and he said, now therefore, fear the Lord, fear Yahweh, and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil 
in your eyes to serve the Lord. Choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers they served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What is, what is Joshua getting at? Joshua is getting at this truth. You have to decide. And what does Joshua do? He decides. He draws a line in the sand and he says, listen, you, you've got to make a decision. If you're going to serve those false gods, go ahead and serve. Them. But I just want you to know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Notice that last statement. Joshua makes a bold declaration, but there's some application in that for us today. He says, as for me, can you say me? Me, me. what is that? That's personal commitment. It's personal commitment. He doesn't say, as for the youth pastor and my kids. He says, as for me. Friends, this starts with personal commitment. But then he says, as for me and my. Can you say my? You see, personal commitment, but also he recognizes personal responsibility. This is my house. God has entrusted this to me. And as for me and my house, check this out. He says, we. Can you say we? Oh, I love this. Because he recognizes older generation and younger generation, we will walk this faith journey together. We will serve the Lord. See, this is why we as Life Center, we can't be so segmented, so siloed. We are a multi-generational church. We are a multi-location church. We are a multi-language church, but we cannot stay siloed. Why? Because we must make a decision. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will make this faith journey together. See, never lose sight of this. Together is a decision. We will do this together. And so can I challenge you, parents in the house, bring your kids into your faith journey. Whether you're a married couple or you are a single parent, bring your kids into your faith journey. Grandparents in the house, maybe your kids are not serving the Lord, but you want your grandkids to serve the Lord and your kids to get saved in the midst of that process. Bring your grandkids into your faith journey. You see, every generation, every generation must decide. And what is the decision that we have to make? First, that we will receive. Joshua says, as for me, it starts with a personal commitment. Don't expect your kids to live out something that you don't actually put value in yourself. And by the way, that's on all of us as Life Center, not just parents. It's on all of us. We will receive. We can either receive the invitation to, to serve the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, or we can reject that invitation, but we must decide, will we receive? But also, each generation must decide, we will give. We will give. I love what it says in Psalm 145, verse four. It says, one generation will, what? Declare your works to the next generation and will proclaim your mighty acts. What's the point? We have something to give. Well, Tyler, I don't know enough scripture. Okay, work on that. But what has God done for you? What has God done in your life? Are you proclaiming that to the younger generation? Again, I remind us, something will outlast us, and that is on us. Something will outlast us. We are deciding daily what will outlast us. What do we need to give? We need to give them Jesus. 
Notice what I said. We need to give them Jesus. I'm not saying we need to give them just religion. I'm not saying we just need to give them rules. I'm not saying we just need to give them church gatherings. We need to give them authentic, life-transforming relationship with Jesus. But remember, we cannot give what we do not have. And so if you do not have authentic, life-transforming relationship with Jesus, again, don't delegate that to Pastor Nick, as amazing as he is. Don't delegate that to Pastor Nate, as amazing as he is. Don't delegate that to the, to the departments of ministries here at Life Center, although we exist to come alongside of you in that journey. But, but again, none of us are exempt. We all play a part in this process, amen? So here's a few thoughts for us as we begin to bring this into conclusion. Number one, understand each generation must decide. But number two, each generation needs a firsthand encounter with God. A firsthand encounter. You see, the stories of the generations before us help to direct us but our own personal encounter with God will transform us. Each generation. And so maybe you're here today because your parents or your grandparents believed it and you're still kind of wrestling going, man, Tyler, I don't know if I'm fully in. Guess what? You need your own firsthand encounter with God. How long has it been? How long has it been since you tasted and that you saw for yourself that Jesus is good? You see, Judges 2.10 reminds us that they rose up and they did not know the Lord personally or relationally. See, one of the things that we're committed to at Life Center, we're committed to help provide these opportunities. Why do we do encounter nights? It's so that you would have a firsthand encounter with God. Why do we do things like summer camp or winter retreat? It's so that our kids would have a firsthand encounter with God. With God, really quick, how many of you in your youth years, you had an incredible encounter with God where he became real at like a summer camp or a retreat? Look around the room. There's a lot of us, that is our story. This is why we invest resources into LC kids or LC students, into life groups, into intentional discipleship environments. Each generation needs a firsthand encounter with God. John Nielsen, a former youth pastor and university campus minister, found three common factors, three, three common factors in the lives of 20-somethings who continue in the faith in which they were raised. How many think that would be good information to know? Because I don't know about you, I don't want to just raise my kids to follow Jesus until they move out of the house. I want them to be more passionate in their 20s than they were in their teens. And here was the three common elements that he found over and over and over again of those who had a true, authentic faith, even in their 20s, in the faith that they were raised up in. You want to know what it was? Number one was this. They experienced true conversion. In other words, they had authentic relationship with Jesus. Number two, they have been equipped to do ministry, not simply entertained in their church or their youth groups. You know what that sounds a lot like? It sounds like these kids were actually equipped not just to go to church, but to be the church. Oh, all of a sudden the language is coming together. Number three, their parents preached the gospel to them. In other words, they had people who consistently pointed them to Jesus over and over and over and over. And I get it. Some of us, we feel like we're treading water as parents right now. We're like, Tyler, it feels like you're handing me another anchor instead of a life jacket. But understand, you're not alone in this journey. This is the importance of us being connected to the church. We all have an assignment. No one is exempt. So you're not raising your kid alone. The church is here to help you in that process. Not only that, Jesus will continue to help you 
in that process. Every generation needs a firsthand encounter with God. Let me say something there. Again, that's not just for the younger generation. Because maybe you're here today and you feel like you're later on in years and you've never had your own firsthand encounter with God. You need that. You need this thing to become your own, real. Not just the story of somebody else, but, but your story. Each generation needs to decide. Each generation needs a firsthand encounter with God. Number three, each generation needs both mentors and models. Each generation needs both mentors and models. Think for a moment, how did Jesus raise up his disciples? Well, one of the things that Jesus did, he, he taught it. He taught it. And some of us, we just want to stop right there. Well, Tyler, if we just keep teaching, if we just keep teaching, just keep giving people information. Some of us, we want to delegate that. Like, it's not my job to teach. Tyler, that's, that's, that's why you're here. No, no, no. You can't even delegate that sole responsibility. Although the church exists to come alongside of you in that process, we all have that responsibility to, to teach the next generation. Jesus taught to his disciples, but he didn't just teach. He also modeled it. Aren't you thankful that Jesus actually lived out what he taught? <laughs> Think about how weird that would be, like reading through the gospels. Like Jesus says this, but then we read that he actually went and punched somebody in the face. Be like, something, something doesn't add up here, right? And isn't it, isn't it hypocrisy that is repellent to so many people about this message of following Jesus? Because they hear people claim that they follow Jesus, but then their love looks nothing like the love of Jesus. The way they serve looks nothing like the way that Jesus served. See, Jesus, he taught it. Jesus, he modeled it. But then Jesus did something crazy. He released them. He sent them out two by two. And listen, some of us, we, we need to get comfortable in releasing the next generation to actually step up into places of ministry. See, I look forward to the day where, where we have teenagers and even kids on this stage leading us in worship. Why? Because we see that we're helping to raise them up. We're looking for those moments. We're looking for those opportunities. He taught it. He modeled it. He released them. They went out two by two. They came back and they said, Lord, even the demons submitted. And he goes, don't rejoice in that. Rejoice that your name's in the book of life. He released, but then what did he do? He had to revisit with them. And some of us, we, we maybe want to teach, but then we don't want to revisit. We, maybe we want to uh, release, but we don't want to revisit. This is an ongoing process of developing. We have to both mentor and model. Great example of this is found in Deuteronomy chapter six. It's a familiar passage to many. It's called the Shema. That word is the Hebrew word for listen or to, to hear, but it's not just passively listening. It's, it's opening up and engaging the whole of who you are and what you're hearing and listening. The Shema, Deuteronomy chapter six, starting in verse four, it says this, listen. Can you say listen? listen. How many of you ever wanted to grab a kid and grab them by the ears and go, listen? How many times do you think God has wanted to grab us by the ears and go, listen? But that's not the tense of what's going on. It's this call to, with the whole of who you are, lean in, pay attention, be present in. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Oh, continues on. Repeat them to your children. 
talk about them, when you sit in your house, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, bind them as a sign on your hand. Let them be a symbol on your forehead. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you will see this where people will literally wrap around their hand with a strap of leather, a little box that in it is the Shema. They will literally tie on their forehead a little box. It's the Shema. Bind it. Then it says this, write them on the doorposts of your house, on your city gates. A little over a year ago when I was in Israel, Every house, every door, every place that I walked into, there was a small little scroll rolled up on the doorpost. What was it? It was the Shema. But I want you to consider what this is actually equipping us to do. It's equipping us that we need to understand we must love God wholeheartedly. All of us all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength. You see, inconsistency and hypocrisy is a repellent to this generation. That's why many people have checked out a church like, it clearly didn't work for them. And we got to continue to lean into the spirit to help us close the gap between what we profess and what we practice. Why? Because this generation needs to see consistency, not perfection, not perfection, consistency. Love God wholeheartedly. But also, don't miss this, we have to apply this practically. You wanna know why I believe so many have, have walked away from the church or even walked away from the faith? It's because they don't see what it really has to do with their day to day lives. And for those of us who have responsibility to raise children or grandchildren, We have an assignment to show them that it's more than just 65 minutes on a Sunday morning. How does it apply to your everyday living? Did you notice the words that are given in the Shema? Talk about this continually with your children. When you sit at home, when you're walking on the road, when you're lying down, when you're getting up, in other words, apply it to the practical aspects of life. And maybe for you, you're like, Tyler, I don't know how it applies to my life. I'm just here on Sunday because I'm looking for something. Well, step back for a moment and think about all the ways that God has showed up and been faithful to you. Because do you feel better knowing that you've been forgiven by a holy God who loves you? How does that then show up and integrate in the way that you lead your business? and you lead your employees. Maybe talk to your kids about that. So for those of you who are business owners, don't just give or pass on to the next generation great business practice. Show them how that following Jesus actually makes the difference. Make it practical. But then also, don't miss this. You gotta give personal testimony. You gotta talk about it. You gotta talk about it. Share how God has set you free and what he has done in your life. Vulnerability and honesty are vital. And so on that note, hear me. When you get together, maybe you're a mentor, you're a young adult and you're helping to mentor some other people. Don't just share your victories. Show the scars that you've got as you walked through some battles, but God was faithful to bring you through the battle. We we have to be willing, we have to be willing. Why? Because this generation will face some of their own battles and they need to be reminded of the testimony. Hey, I remember that person and the scar that they had. And although there was a scar there, they're still alive. And if God could do it for them, maybe he can do it for me. See, this matters. Tell them and show them that God can be trusted. Don't don't just say the words, don't just delegate that responsibility to some social media influencer. You share. In Life Center, we have a collective responsibility. All of us have this assignment. That's, by the way, why we are doing a parenting conference in just a couple of weeks. Today, you can sign up to be a part of that. You can go out to the foyer and sign up today to be a part of it. Why? Because we're gonna talk about some of the tough stuff. What is that? 
How do we raise kids to grow in love and follow the way of Jesus? How do we actually do that? We're talking about four essentials to a flourishing family. We're also gonna talk about parenting in the digital age. How many know parenting is hard enough? The digital age brings a whole nother layer of complexity. So some of you, you need to sign up. Maybe you're a grandparent and you're realizing, man, I, I think I need to go to that parenting conference. Sign up, come be a part, come be a part. See, it's been said over time that the church is always one generation away from extinction. And here's what I want us to determine in our hearts today, not on our watch. See, we're not gonna do a repeat of Judges chapter two, verse 10. We don't want just the stories to be of, of how God used to move and now this generation has no clue or concept of who this God is that we're talking about. We should commit not on our watch, but in order for that to be a reality, we gotta lean in, why? Because no one is exempt from this assignment. Our kids, our students, our young adults, and those alive who don't yet know Jesus, understand, we must commit to do our part to leading and developing them to love and serve Jesus. So today, we're gonna make this really practical. We're gonna pray. We're gonna pray for this generation. So can I invite you to stand to your feet? I know sometimes in this setting, in this environment, it's easy to kind of observe what's going on stage. I'm asking that you would participate. Come on, 10 a.m., I know there's some prayer warriors in the house today. We're, we're gonna pray for this generation. Parents, I'm calling you to pray for your kids right now. Grandparents, I'm calling you to pray for your kids and your grandkids. All of us, if, if you're not in either one of those categories, guess what? We're still gonna pray for kids. We're still gonna pray for teens. We're still gonna pray for young adults. We're still gonna pray for the adults in our generation who need to be discipled and raise up to love and serve Jesus. And here's what we're gonna pray, because we're gonna pray that, that this generation will decide. We're gonna pray that this generation will have a firsthand encounter with Jesus. We're gonna pray that, that this generation will have both mentors and models. And you wanna know one of my secret prayers this week is that as we pray for that, some of you are gonna hear the Holy Spirit and go, stop praying about it, go do it. Because not, not everybody, but, but some people in the room, you need to find Pastor Nick and say, hey, I can, I can give a weekend a month to serve in LC Kids. Some of you, you need to find Pastor Nate and, and say, hey, I wanna, I wanna help out with LC students. Again, that's not for everybody. We all have an assignment, but I was, I was here last Sunday night in this room for LC students. It's amazing how God is working in the hearts of our young people. And I was so excited to watch the amount of leaders up front and watch lines of students, but my heart also broke, why? Because students had to wait in line far too long for a leader to pray with them. That's how hungry they are. And I found myself saying, God, you gotta you got raise up more leaders who will pray for students, who will intercede for students, who will be a model and a mentor to students. We need that. We need that. So today, can we pray? Can we pray for this generation? Come on, will you join me right now? Jesus, I thank you for your love and your commitment from generation to generation. Lord, I pray that today we would recognize that none of us are exempt. We all play a role. We all have an assignment. And so Holy Spirit, will you speak to us about that? God, I pray that today that we would understand that each generation must decide. God, I pray that our decision would be much like Joshua's. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I pray that we would have that understanding that, that it is a personal commitment, but also there's personal responsibility, but also there's this collective journeying together. And God as well, we pray for every generation to have a first hand encounter with you. God, thank you for the testimonies who have experienced your goodness, but God, we don't just wanna live off the testimony of somebody else. We wanna taste and see for ourselves.
And God, we pray that for our children. We pray that for our grandchildren. God, I pray that for this generation of young adults. God, that there would be hearts open as they encounter you for themselves. And God, I pray that you would raise up mentors and models. God, I pray that you'd put it in the heart of your people today on how we are called to be a part of this collectively together to help raise up this generation. God, I pray that we wouldn't just mentor through teaching, but God, that we would also demonstrate in the way that we live that this way is the right way. That God, you can be trusted. That you are faithful. Some of us, we, we have the scars to show that even though you walk through battles, God is faithful to deliver us from them all. And so Lord, I pray, raise up mentors and models. God, I pray collectively as a church community that, that we would love and believe in this generation that it would permeate every department, every area of ministry. God, never let us become siloed. Never let us hold on more tightly to our preferences than we hold on to the potential of the generations to come. So God, I pray that we would be led by your spirit. And Lord, would you raise up this generation to love you and follow you all the days of their life. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, if you believe that, would you say amen?